Welcome back, everybody. Today on The Joseph Carlson Show, we have a lot of news to get into. First of all, Facebook, or Meta rather, is now preparing for layoffs. So they hired a whole lot of people over the past couple of years. Now they've decided they're going to cut back. We're going to jump into this news. I'll share my opinion on it and why I actually think this is a good thing. I say that as being sympathetic and empathetic of the employees being laid off. But in terms of the actual company and the financials and the prospects, this is something that's long overdue. And we're going to explain why in this episode. Now, we also have Jeremy Siegel, who's still upset at the Fed. He's Jerome Powell's worst nightmare. He went on to CNBC to explain his frustration once more. We'll get his updated opinion. And we have the continued collapse of other companies like Carvana. This one is now down 96% year to date. I'm not making that up. That's not an exaggeration. It's down 96% just this year. And this is dot-com level stuff. This is the most I've ever seen companies fall in real time. In this episode, we're going to take a look at what went wrong. We're going to do kind of an assessment. We're going to look at the damage scene and see if we can find the black box. What is it that really made Carvana crash? So as always, we have a lot to get into in this episode, a lot of exciting news to cover. If you like this type of content, make sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon. You can follow along for free. Now, you're looking at the passive income portfolio. This is a real portfolio with real money that I've been investing in for a number of years now. The goal of it is to grow a stream of passive income, which by my definition is income that I don't have to actively work for. We can bicker back and forth about the definition of active income and passive income, but I consider dividends, dividend income from investments, to be highly passive. In fact, I consider it to be one of the most pure forms of passive income. You buy into a company, which initially takes work to earn the money, but once you have the money and you've bought a stake into a company, it can provide you with an annuity-like stream of income for the rest of your life. The companies that I bought into in the passive income portfolio, companies like Vici, JP Morgan, and Apple pay me this stream of continual dividends every single month. I'm getting this money all the time, and I don't work at Apple. I haven't worked at Apple my entire life, but I got a $77 dividend. I've never been an employee of Costco. I've never clocked into this company once, but they're paying me a $64 dividend. Again, Starbucks isn't a company that I've done any work in, and I'm getting $170 in dividend income. That's because I own equity in these companies, and they continue to pay out their shareholders. The thing I love about this income is it's highly motivating even when the market continues to go down. This year has been brutal in terms of total returns. The market has continued to go down month after month, but if you're focused on the actual operating results of your businesses and the dividend income, it makes it a lot easier to keep focused on the overall goal. The overall goal is to grow the economics of the portfolio, to grow its earnings power. I keep track of this growth on this chart here, and this one is by far my favorite chart out of any of them that I keep track of. I would recommend making this same type of chart on a Google spreadsheet if you don't have access to Qualtrum, but this is available on Qualtrum if you wanna join the Patreon. This shows my dividend income year over year with the associated growth rate. And I've been tracking this since the beginning of my portfolio. You can see the dramatic growth year over year as I started it. It's easy to grow dividend income starting off because you simply just deposit money, you earn more money because of dividends. But over time, it becomes a little bit more of a challenge. As the portfolio gets bigger and bigger, it takes more and more capital to be able to deposit to move the needle. But you also have a lot of things that help you out. The companies raise their dividend over time. Almost all of my companies have announced dividend raises anywhere from 7 to 16%. They're growing their dividend income in and of themselves quite quickly. The next thing is reinvesting these dividends. In 2018, I reinvested that $378. In 2019, I reinvested the $1,700 I was paid. That reinvesting of the dividend speeds up this snowball. And with your contributions, on top of dividend raises and reinvestments, That's where we get the continual growth in the economics of the portfolio. Year to date in 2022, my dividend income is up 9% over the entire full year of 2021. And we still have November and December. So this growth rate will even go up year over year. This is very exciting to see. It's very motivating for me. There's a quote I love from Benjamin Graham, the father of value investing. He said, quote, the true investor will do better if he forgets about the stock market 
and pays attention to his dividend returns and to the operation results of his companies. Forget about the stock market. Forget about the unpredictable variations and price fluctuations. Instead, focus on the dividend income and the operating results of your businesses. That's exactly what I'm doing with this chart. I'm looking at the actual results of my companies. And even though the stock market has gone down a lot from 2021 to 2022, my actual operating results are better. My companies are increasing dividends. They're increasing free cash flow. My portfolio is producing more income than last year. So even though this has been really, frankly, a brutal year, it's just been tough. There's no way around it. I still remain highly motivated. I feel like I'm getting closer to my goal because the amount of income that this is producing continues to go up. So I'm going to continue building up this portfolio as much as possible. I do have a goal to one day have this portfolio generate enough passive income that it meaningfully subsidizes my cost of living or completely replaces it. Meaning that I can literally live completely off of the passive income. That is the end goal. So as we go through this channel, what I'm gonna do is show the results with complete transparency. You'll be able to see every single week, good or bad, what comes with a portfolio, and I'll show you the steps that I'm making, if they're mistakes or if they're good decisions. Now, moving on from the specific portfolio, I wanna get in some news here. The headline news that was released late Sunday evening was a little bit of a rumor released from the Wall Street Journal. They had some employees report that Meta is preparing to notify employees of large-scale layoffs this week. Not fun news if you're a Meta employee, but if we actually look at how the stock is responding, we can see that the stock went up big today. 6.53%. And we have a note here from Qualtrum saying Meta platform shares are trading higher following the Wall Street Journal report suggesting the company is planning to announce layoffs this week. So why is that? Why are investors actually excited at a company getting rid of employees? They say that Meta is planning to begin large-scale layoffs this week according to people familiar with the matter in what could be the largest round in a recent spat of tech job cuts after an industry's rapid growth during the pandemic. That part right here, this end part of the sentence, I think is the most important. This is following rapid growth in employee counts for these companies, sometimes ridiculously fast growth. For example, right now in this report, they say Meta reported more than 87,000 employees as of September. So Meta has 87,000 employees now. If we go back to just 2019, just three years ago, Meta had half as many employees. They doubled their entire headcount in a three-year period. And I've been sitting on the sidelines saying for a long time, these companies are over hiring. They're doing too much hiring. And for the amount of employees they have, they're not shipping enough products. And this is going to be a problem that eventually will get addressed. Well, here we have Meta finally addressing this problem. They say that the planned layoffs would be the first broad headcount reduction to occur in the company's 18-year history. So for the first time ever, this company's finally going to be laying off employees. Now again, I want to stress that I'm not one that gets excited to see employees get fired from a company. That is not something that I like seeing. And in the case of Meta or Twitter, if you're one of these employees getting laid off, I really do hope that you find work quickly. But from the perspective of an investor, which I am, I have to look at this objectively. I think that companies like Meta and Amazon and Google and Microsoft have simply been hiring employees too quickly, and it's becoming a real expense for the shareholder. Let's go ahead and take a look at an example of this for Meta. On Qualtrum Insights here, we have the free cash flow chart. We've all seen this before. It's very simple. It shows me on a free cash flow quarter over quarter. Free cash flow is calculated by taking the cash flow from operations and then subtracting the capital expenditures. And you can see that Meta has done a good job historically growing its free cash flow aside for the last year. It's been starting to go down in the past year. But overall, the company does generate growing free cash flows. Now, what I've done is I've added in a new graph here. We can toggle the chart right here and it shows a new bar. This purple bar here is the stock-based compensation that the company's paying to employees. So now we can see both the free cash flow quarter by quarter. And then in addition to that, we can see how much they're paying in stock-based compensation. What we can see is that a lot of the free cash flow that Meta actually generates goes to the employees. Maybe around uh, 25%, maybe 30% of it is going to the employees. And the more concerning thing is, if we look back in 2018, the actual cost of the employee stock-based compensation was $1 billion per quarter. 
So $4 billion per year. That was the cost of dilution for paying these employees. When we fast forward to the most recent quarter, Meta paid $3 billion in stock-based compensation in one quarter. So in one quarter, they paid as much stock-based compensation as they did for three quarters in 2019. So Meta's employee cost, the stock-based compensation expense for employees, is eating up a greater and greater portion of the company's free cash flows. And we can see the problems converging all at once. The stock-based compensation expense is growing over time as the cash flows are starting to go down. In combination, this isn't leaving a lot of money for the shareholders. But the truth is, this problem of too many employees costing companies too much is a solvable problem. It's fixable, and it's fixable through layoffs, exactly what Meta's doing. We don't know how many employees Meta's gonna be laying off. They're gonna be announcing that later this week, but my assumption, my prediction is it's going to be a lot. I think it will be multiple thousands, if not above 10,000 employees. We'll see, maybe they'll start with a smaller amount and they'll try to scale up the amount of layoffs later, but my prediction is they can get rid of a lot of employees without really hampering the operations of the company. Now, Meta's not the only company that I think will be doing layoffs soon. I think this is gonna become more of a common theme. There's some companies that I think were responsible with the amount of employees that they hired over the past three years. For example, from 2019 to current day, Apple only increased their employee count by 20%, compared to Meta's 100% increase. So we look at Apple right here, and we look at their free cash flows, and we compare that against their stock-based compensation expense, employees really aren't that big of an expense. 2021, they did $93 billion in free cash flows, and they only paid $8 billion in stock-based compensation. So even though that's a big number, Apple, comparatively speaking, is running a very efficient business. They generate a lot of free cash flow compared to their employee expense. And not every company's like this. Most of them don't run as efficiently as Apple. We can take Google, for example. This is one of the companies that I've been scratching my head, wondering why they're hiring so many employees. Last quarter, they hired 13,000 employees. That is an enormous amount. Year over year, they increase the employee count by 36%. And you can see the effect all these additional employees have on stock-based compensation and dilution. Over the past five years, the stock-based compensation expense for Google has grown at a 22% CAGR. That's actually a faster growth rate than their overall free cash flow. So they are growing their expenses faster than their free cash flows. And now it's gotten to the point where their employee expense makes up a third of their total free cash flow. For example, last quarter, Google had $16 billion in free cash flow and $5 billion in stock-based compensation. This is an incredible amount of stock-based compensation that's eating up a lot of these free cash flows. And that leaves a lot less money for the investor. I think there's a very high chance that we'll see similar layoffs with Google in time. I think similar to Meta right now, Google overhired and they're gonna be cutting back. The other example we could look at is Amazon. They likewise increased their workforce by over double since 2019. If we look at the stock-based compensation of this company, you can see the clear trend there. It's going up over time at a very rapid rate while their cash flows go into the negative. Last quarter, they had minus $5 billion in free cash flow and their stock-based compensation was a record high $5.5 billion. That's for one quarter not for the full year. This is problematic for Amazon shareholders. They have cash flows going negative and stock-based compensation going up. Until these companies really solve this problem, we're gonna to continue to see them trade down. Amazon's down 47% because investors are not happy with the financials. Meta's down an astounding 73% this year with investors likewise not happy with the financials and the direction of the whole metaverse bet. Investors are very concerned about this company. Even Google, with their decelerating growth in their business and their rising expenses, is down 40% year to date. That's a staggering amount. Investors are signaling that they're clearly not happy with the financial performance of Google recently. While on the inverse side, we have Apple, exercising good cost control, good discipline with their hiring, and only increasing their workforce by 20%, this company hasn't sold off nearly to the extent of these other big tech companies. So in my opinion, when I look at this, when I see this news of layoffs, even though, again, I stress over and over again, I hope these employees find new work very quickly. I don't find any joy in people losing their jobs, but from an investor perspective, this is necessary. These companies need to generate real profitability and huge bloated companies don't typically do well in the long run. So I see companies that can exercise good cost control and hire on a very disciplined pace over time 
as ones that I'm really paying attention to. So far, I've been really impressed with the discipline Apple has shown. I haven't seen that from Meta or Google or Amazon. Now, moving on from that, I wanna get into this interview with Jeremy Siegel, again, commenting on the Fed. We know that he's bullish on the market right now, and he really doesn't like how far the Fed is going with raising interest rates. Here's his latest comments on it. I was listening to the Powell news conference and um, uh, an AP reporter, um, Chris uh, Rugober, asked the question that I, I've been talking about all the time. He, he asked Powell, he said, you know, there, there's two housing indexes. And I'm talking about this because we are going to get the CPI in a couple of days. He said there's the, the forward looking one that uses current data uh, on, on what's going on in housing. And then there's the one that the BLS calculates, which is some crazy average of past data. <laughs> and um, and he said, well, which one do you like? And he said, and I was shocked because Chairman Powell said, yeah, uh, we're using the one that uses past data. And, and this is not just a technical point because these two indexes, remember, housing is 40% of the core inflation, which is what Powell talks about all the time. Um, if you use the current one, you actually get negative prices and rentals. If you look at the backward looking one, you get positive ones. Uh, that make all the difference. Um, so, and so, you know, I was saying they're looking at the wrong indicators. I somewhat agree with what Jeremy's saying here. The housing market is moving quickly. Prices have shifted from going up to now going down, and the Fed is working with old data. But you also have to look at the Fed's perspective. They're supposed to look at old data. That's how they can make decisions based off of real data, because future data is not real data. Implied data or assumptions about the future is basically educated guessing. And putting the Fed in this situation, I think, is very difficult. Either the Fed looks at historical data, which is certain, or they guess and look at future data, which isn't certain. Right now, the Fed is choosing to look at old data. So while I agree somewhat with what Jeremy's saying, I think the Fed actually has a point where they have to look at what actually happened. They can't really guess about the future and make assumptions that may be totally incorrect. If they do that and they get it wrong, and they're basing their decisions off of things that don't happen in the future, they could make the situation even worse. Because Jeremy keeps mentioning forward-looking indicators. Because when you look at the forward-looking indicators of inflation, they are down. I mean, when, when he said, you know, I'm more uh, hawkish than I was in September. Well, since September, we haven't had anything that shows the prices are going up except the backward-looking indicators. So, I mean, I, I think it's just a realization of what is going on in the market. I think the, the market, you know, is sort of saying, yeah, the Powell's talking hawkish. He's going to pivot. He's going to realize that housing is not going up. The CPI is going to show another increase. Um, but, you know, at the same time, the case Shiller, the federal housing prices and the rental indexes from Zillow and, and apartment lists right. and all the others are going down. I'm on the fence on this one. I really think the Fed has a point. They can't make the assumption that things are going to be really good in the future without knowing that data for sure. And when they're looking at the historical data, they're seeing inflation continue to go up. If inflation really starts to go down, eventually it will be reflected in the historical data. We will see that happen. But so far, we really haven't had a lot of evidence of that. Now, finally, we have Carvana. This is a company that I do not think is a good company. I don't think this company's ever been a really good company. But at one point, this is one of the most favorited companies by gurus online, FinTwit gurus, TikTok gurus, and YouTube gurus. They liked Carvana because like the dreams and promises of many companies, it was going to revolutionize an industry. It's going to change the way that people bought cars. Carvana, with their nice little logo and their tower of cars. But after a certain amount of time, the truth eventually comes out. The math adds up and you realize the emperor had no clothes. Carvana's down 15% today after another bad earnings report. But the more striking thing is that it's down 96% year to date. 96%. It IPO'd at $11 per share, and the company went all the way up to $370 per share at one point in time. How does this company go up to $370 per share? Well, you might think that it's dumb retail investors bidding it up. That's part of the problem, 
but it was also the pros. Morgan Stanley had a $420 price target on this company just last year, and Morgan Stanley is now saying that the company could trade all the way down to $1. Like usual, the analyst price targets don't provide a lot of value. When I look at Carvana and what happened with this company, it was always there. The data was always available. We look at the revenue of the company, and the revenue's growing. That's good, but that's not the full story of a company, and revenue doesn't equal profits. Many companies generate growing revenues, but they don't have any value whatsoever in those revenues. The company's worth billions of dollars, and at the most, it generated $80 million of EBITDA. The last couple of quarters, it has negative EBITDA. The cash flows of this company have been negative since day one. They've never had a single quarter of positive free cash flow. All this company has done over its entire life cycle is lost money every single quarter like clockwork. And while it's lost money, it's raised a lot of debt, so the company's heavily indebted. They don't have any money to pay out a dividend, so don't even dream of that happening. And the shares outstanding are going up like crazy because of dilution. It makes you wonder how a company like this could have ever gone up to the price it did. I think the answer is in relative value. Not the fair value of the company, but the relative value. When investors price companies based off of what a similar company is priced as, that can lead to ever-increasing prices. Carvana is expensive, but it's a little bit cheaper than Opendoor. It's a little bit cheaper than Snapchat. It's a little bit cheaper than this company or that company. So it's not too expensive, relatively speaking. That's the problem right there, relatively speaking. With companies like this, we should look at the absolute fundamentals. We see a company that does not generate any profits, a company that doesn't generate any earnings, a company that has negative net income, a company that's heavily indebted, a company that relies on dilution, and a company with rapidly growing expenses. When you put all of that together, right now I get a company that I wouldn't pay much of anything for. This company's really not worth a lot. In fact, even after this substantial price drop, I think the company is substantially overvalued at $1.56 billion. So I said this before and I'll say it again. Just because a stock drops 80% doesn't mean it can't drop more. And just because Carvana has dropped 96% doesn't mean it can't drop 99%. In my opinion, I still think this company has a ways to go down towards its fair value, its true fair value. And that's why we avoid companies like that on this channel. When I do investments, I do them based off of the actual intrinsic value of the company, not their relative value compared to the next closest company. I look at the actual cash flows they produce and the money they're gonna provide me over the long term. So that's all for this episode. I hope you enjoyed. I'll have another update later this week. We have some good content coming out, so make sure you're subscribed if you haven't, and I'll see you in the next one.